Uh, we can leave that one open. Yeah, I prefer to have that one shut. Yeah. Marcus, uh, am I in the light here? Is this good? Vancouver Aquarium Marine Aquarium is a nonprofit organization 
conservation of aquatic life. Our vision is a world where aquatic life is diverse and Our program this weekend is the Vancouver Fish Hackathon. Coders will tirelessly create web and mobile apps to help solve some of the world's biggest fisheries issues today. Fish Hackathon is a worldwide initiative led by the United States Department of State. 43 cities are participating in this year's Fish Hackathon. And a good friend of mine, Secretary of State John Kerry, wants to share a few words with you. And that's not the right slide. Play button. Nope, it's going backwards. There we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third annual Fish Hackathon. I want to congratulate the Department's Office of Global Partnerships for once again bringing this event together. And I want to thank the Virgin Group for providing the grand prize this year. I'm also very grateful for the generous support that we've received from the host facilities and partners, aquariums, tech hubs, embassies, universities, and others. You've all been terrific. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for your time and your willingness to get involved. The first Fish Hackathon brought together innovators in five cities across the U.S. And last year, that grew to 12 cities in a handful of different countries. This year, more than 40 cities on six different continents are hosting Fish Hackathon events. The growing global reach of this event is exciting. It's also important, and probably it's no surprise to all of you. The threats to our planet's fisheries have to concern all of us. Just think about it. More than 7 billion people on our planet, and a significant chunk of us rely on fish as a major source of protein every single day. And protecting fish stocks is not just important in terms of food security, it's vital in terms of economic security, especially in coastal areas. 10 to 12 percent of the world's population depends on fisheries and aquaculture for their livelihoods. And the vast majority of those people are employed by small-scale fishing outfits that struggle in the face of overfishing, illegal fishing, pollution, and other threats to marine life. So today, we are looking to you, coders, designers, innovators of all different backgrounds, to help out by applying your unique skills to these critical challenges. Last year, volunteers of Fish Hackathon events created mobile apps to display fishing laws and regulations based on a user's location, apps to teach children about sustainable fishing through interactive games, apps to report marine mammal protection concerns, and more. And this year, we have a whole new set of problems that scientists and industry experts have submitted in hopes that you'll be able to help. So we look forward to the results and to working with you to see the very best of your ideas implemented in order to benefit sustainable fisheries and the communities that they support. So I want you to know you are joining a worthy cause. And if past years are any indication at all, you're going to have a lot of fun along the way. Thanks again to all of you for taking time to participate and for volunteering your energy and your talent. Believe me, it can make a difference. Good luck and code on. Thank you, John. Just take a moment to uh, give you a bit of information and uh, recognize some of our supporters for the Vancouver Fish Hackathons. We have the United States Department of State, the City of Vancouver, Sustainability Group, and Parks Board. OceanWise, Vancouver Aquarium's uh, Sustainable Seafood Team, Penago Pizza, Hard Bite Chips, and Three Farmers. You'll learn more about Three Farmers later tonight when you're hungry and want a snack. So this weekend, we'd like you to use some social media to share the work that you're doing. The hashtag code for fish at Fish Hackathon would be great. These are two social media uh, vehicles to use over the weekend. Our schedule. This is the basic 
7.30 p.m. tonight, coding will begin. That's in about an hour and a bit. Uh, we're going to do a tour here in the aquarium and hear about fisheries issues and the problem statements that we are uh, being given this year uh, shortly. And then uh, on Sunday, that'll be when we're going to wrap up the fish hackathon. Uh, 12.30 will end. We'll have our winners and everything announced just before then. Okay, so I would like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, Loren Schiller is an analyst for the OceanWise Sustainable Seafood Team. She has a Master's of Science from the University of British Columbia, and she is an expert in fisheries management and governance. And she's going to give you an overview of fisheries issues today and some of the problem statements that we have this year for the Fish Hackathon. Loren? Hi, you guys. How are you doing? I, ooh, I'm sorry. I hope you're really excited. I'm just going to grab my notes because I don't have presenter view. Um, so what you're looking at right now is a map of the world. And you're looking, all of the red and orange shows fishing effort in the 1950s. So we're talking more than 60 years ago. This is the scale at which fishing was occurring in our oceans. This is what it was five years ago. So this is from 2010. And as you can see, fisheries are, they're no longer coastal. They've reached the high seas. They've reached regions far beyond coasts. Um, not only are they going farther out to sea, they're also fishing deeper. They're fishing species that this is. Um, you guys to try and, and contextualize how big the world's fisheries are um, through this map. Um, and fisheries, as you're going to see, come in all shapes and sizes. So this is a super trawler. Um, these ships can have nets upward of 140 meters long. They're absolutely massive. They usually catch smaller fish um, that, that live in the sort of near the surface area. Um, they can employ, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people on one boat. They even have processing abilities on the boat in some cases. Um, so these, these are absolutely huge, huge fishing boats and they roam um, the, the world's oceans and often don't even stop um, for months on end. Um, they're, they're able to catch that many fish. Compared to these guys, um, so these are small scale fishers in Sri Lanka. They're using a very, very traditional method of fishing. They're sitting on these little, um, these little platforms and they're using effectively fishing poles made of wood and line and they're catching fish really close to the shore. And this practice is um, historical. It's been going on in that part of the world for a really long time. Um, but as you can see, nowhere near the same um, type of gear, the same scale as that super trawler. Um, so this is a, a dogfish fishery in the United Kingdom. So um, dogfish actually has an interesting story. Uh, for a while, um, Fish and chips was usually historically cod, uh, especially in the United Kingdom and also off of Canada. But as a result of overfishing um, and depleting cod stocks around the world, they've actually switched to dogfish, which is a type of shark. Um, and they often serve that now as fish and chips. But um, this just wanted to show uh, that pretty much any species can be caught, uh, not only fish, sharks, um, invertebrates, so things like sea cucumbers, sea urchins. Uh, fisheries are massive in their scale, uh, both in terms of the species they catch and the gears that they use. They're also very dangerous. So this is crab fishing in the Bering Sea. Um, I would question anyone who tells me that fishing isn't a dangerous occupation. There are some places in the world where fishers actually die as a result of fishing practices. So I really just wanted to use this photo to show you some of the conditions that, that commercial fishers are used to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, just try and keep that in perspective as you're going through some of the problem statements because um, some of them have to deal with uh, fishers working conditions and, and the ability of collecting data while they're trying to manage these kinds of conditions while also trying to bring in as much fish or in this case crab as possible. So try and keep the fishers in mind as well. Um, similarly, here's another type of fishery. This is, um, so Indonesia and the Philippines account for some of the world's um, greatest take of tuna. So these are really, really um, large tuna catching countries, but almost all of it is caught at a small scale. So these are fishers that go out in boats. They catch um, sort of a boatload as they go. 
Um, but just because they're using these little boats doesn't mean that the catch isn't massive. But um, what I want you to take home from this photo and also this one is, you know, think about these conditions. They don't necessarily have the capacity to, to use a mobile app at this exact moment or sort of thinking about the, the challenges in terms of collecting data when you're, when you're sorting through a boat full of skipjack tuna like this. You know, what, what actual tools do they have on hand? Um, so really, really try and think about, about that in the context of the problem statements because this is what, what you're trying to, to improve. You're trying to make it easier for these guys to record data or solve a variety of problems. Um, same with this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but we also have to think about the impacts that fisheries have on other types of marine life. So there are a couple problem statements this year regarding ghost gear. So gears can have an impact um, while uh, fishermen are fishing, so they're what's, with what's known as bycatch. So this is when, when you set a long line or your purse seine and you accidentally catch, um, say, sharks or, or turtles or seabirds. Um, but there's also problems related to when a fisher, um, when a fishing boat loses its gear. So gear is really expensive. Fishers don't like to lose it for the most part, uh, but it does happen. And what happens when this gear gets lost at sea is sometimes it can, it can ensnare marine mammals and other types of animals, um, but there's no real way of knowing where this gear is um, or sort of the impacts that it's having. And if you can imagine all of the ocean's currents and processes, you know, something that's lost at sea could get carried thousands of kilometers away and actually have a fairly substantial impact somewhere where um, that's, that's very, very far from where it was lost. Um, I want you guys to also think about the scale of, of seafood supply chains. So this photo is from Skiji Market. It's a, it's a market in Tokyo. It's the largest seafood market in the world. Um, and I, I've had the, the fortune to go to Skiji. And you're there, it's absolutely overwhelming the amount of um, seafood that's there, both processed, unprocessed. You go by, you go by booths, and there's there's fish that you've never even seen before. There's they're selling kelp, they're selling roe, they're selling octopus, they're selling every single species that you could possibly imagine in the ocean is above land. And just think about the the traceability that's associated with this kind of thing, the labeling practices, um, how to identify certain types of fish um, if they've been processed. Um, similar to this photo, you know, when you go to the grocery store and, and you're looking in the seafood counter, um, if nothing's labeled, how do you know what you're looking at? I mean, I, I've been studying fish, I like to say, as long as I've been alive. But, um, you know, I, I go to a seafood counter and I see a filet of, of salmon, and this, this could be pink salmon, or it could be Atlantic farm salmon, or, or maybe it's even coho, or it could be trout, you know? If it's not labeled, I don't know. Um, similarly, the piece of white fish on the left, that could be dozens and dozens of species. And it's really, really hard to tell um, what you're eating or what you're buying if there's no information. So um, that's something to keep in mind in terms of the challenges of dealing with, with um, the market and, and what people want and balancing um, sort of the global nature of, of seafood transport, so to speak. So I'm going to quickly go through um, sort of whatever and why I think it's sort of related to some of the problem statements. So there's this really famous quote in fishery science that counting fish is just like counting trees, except that they're invisible and they move. And that really, really embodies the role of a fishery scientist or a fisheries manager. It's, it's virtually impossible to count fish is, is the take home of this message. And, and as you saw in some of the photos, um, you know, gathering data is really, really important for managing fisheries in terms of um, making smart management decisions like setting a quota or closing an area that you know is, is sensitive in terms of the habitat or maybe there's, there's a turtle um, spawning beach or, or something like that. You need to know these things, but you also need to know um, the impacts that, that fisheries have on, on those kinds of areas. Um, and as a result, we're really, really dependent on getting as much information from fisheries as possible. Um, because we can't go count fish, counting fish that have been caught is the next best thing. Um, but as you saw, data collection is probably not the main priority for a fisher, especially if he's, he or she is hauling in a, a big trap full of crabs amidst a giant rogue wave or something, that's probably not their, their main concern. Um, 
Sorry, so, so in my opinion, I think that problem statements one and four kind of delve into that, some of the challenges associated with data collection. Um, problem statements two and seven. Um, so collecting data alone is challenging, but making sure that it's uniform across regions is even more challenging. I mean, how do you make um, information that comes from a Japanese longline vessel that's fishing in the Pacific um, line up with something that comes from, you know, a small-scale um, skipjack tuna fishing boat in, in the Philippines. So making sure that that uniform is, is translatable across different groups. Um, and, and we need this in order to see how these different fisheries interact with each other. So you need to be speaking the same language effectively. Um, we also, as in the world of fisheries, we like to predict what's going to happen um, as a result of either fishing practices or in the case of problem statement three, it's looking at um, the impacts of an invasive species um, and trying to figure out um, understanding the behavior of that species as a result of, of a model, effectively. So um, for anyone who's interested in, in modeling, that would probably be the problem statement for you. Um, it's important to know that you know every fish, uh, their behavior is related to environmental conditions, um, habitat, food availability, that kind of thing. So something to keep in mind as you go through that one. Problem statement five. Um, so this is something I'm really interested in. So programs like, I don't know if you've heard of Jelly Watch or the Cetacean Sightings Network that we have um, here at the Vancouver Aquarium. So these are citizen science initiatives where we actually tap into to the general public to gain information about um, a certain species or a certain trend. So, so Jelly Watch is effectively an app. Um, if you see any jellyfish anywhere in the world, you can log in, plug in where you are, and tell the app, and then it basically keeps all that information. So things like that. Um, and if apps are properly designed, you can actually glean a lot of information from citizen science initiatives. So that one is kind of along the lines of problem statement five. Um, problem statement six, so um, understanding the impacts of, of certain fisheries. Um, so this gets into that, that ghost gear um, initiative that I was telling you about. So. Um, gears can, can easily get lost at sea for some fisheries, and um, using spatial data um, could really enhance fishers' ability to monitor their gear um, in terms of making sure they get back to it on time, or if their gear is lost, being able to recover that gear before it gets lost and drifts thousands of kilometers away um, or potentially interacts with some, some other types of animals and causes damage that way. So that's problem statement six. I talked about seven already. Um, so seafood traceability and fraud. Um, as I showed from those photos, like it's it's so 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 difficult to know what a, a seafood product is simply by looking at it. Um, and even even with labeling, um, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes this is accidental. Um, fish is mislabeled unintentionally, but there is a big and growing concern with um, seafood fraud. So the mis the intentional mislabeling of products. So how can we ensure that that's um, minimized? How can we make it easier for people to know exactly what, um, whether they are eating Atlantic salmon or whether that's, that's um, pink salmon caught from the wild or something like that? Um, yeah, and so problem statement eight really looks at getting into identifying products based on visual cues. Um, I have been told that the information for that one is mostly all in Spanish, so if any of you are looking to practice your language skills at the same time, or you're fluent in Spanish, um, that is the problem statement for you. Um, and lastly, um, information sharing. So I talked about this um, in terms of sharing between regions, but um, like when you're looking at um, those fishers that were collecting skipjack on the boat. So they're um, regulated both at the regional level, um, so the particular place that they're fishing might have certain restrictions about where they're allowed to fish. They're regulated at the national level, so there might be um, federal regulations about how much they're allowed to catch. And then they're regulated at, say, the international level by an overarching government body that manages all the tuna in their ocean. So ensuring that, that those management regulations line up um, and that those fishers understand what they all are when they're fishing in a given location is really, really important. Um, so those are effectively the problem statements, sort of. Um, you guys may have had a chance to see them online already. Um, they're available in way more detail. Um, 
and the actual specifics of the problem statements. If you go online after this talk, um, you'll be able to see them and filter through them. Um, luckily, sort of luckily, um, you get a little bit of help from the fisheries world um, to guide you on your journey because we realize that um, you're all very, very intelligent when it comes to computers, but you might not have had much experience um, for fisheries yet. That's okay. So um, I'm going to be here this evening. I'm also going to be here tomorrow morning, and I'm helping judge on Sunday. Um, and I'll get to judging in a second. But we also have a few mentors here and remotely over the weekend. So um, I'm going to introduce them, and I'm going to try not to mess this up. <clears throat> so um, mentors, if you could just give a wave and stand up. Um, if you're here, that would be great. So um, here we have uh, Dr. Wolf Swartz, who is a fisheries economist with the Narius program at the University of British Columbia. Um, his interest includes uh, seafood supply chain dynamics, fishery subsidies, seafood pricing, and corporate social responsibility. So if you have questions about economics or supply chain management in the context, yeah. or fisheries in general, Wilf is your man. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that we're all fairly comfortable talking about fisheries in general, but um, we all have very different specific backgrounds. Um, Beth Sharp is here um, from World Animal Protection, where she's been the communications director for five years. Um, she's led public advocacy campaigns on topics ranging from protecting wildlife through tourism to choosing humane food options at home. So um, Beth and her colleagues uh, were, were involved in the ghost gear um, statement. So if you want to talk to someone in person about either of those, uh, Beth would probably be your best contact. Excuse me, we also have um, Gideon Jones, who works for the Emerald Sea Protection Society. So uh, he focuses mainly on data analysis, mapping, and web application design. He builds online location collaboration tools. Um, Gideon also develops theoretical models of net and gear distribution and mapping tools to build a knowledge repository that can help multiple stakeholders. So again, someone who knows a little bit about ghost gear, fishing gears, um, but also has a bit of that technical background. Um, and I'll mention that, that Gideon is also one of our judges, um, as is Wilf. So we are three of your judges um, come Sunday. Um, who else have we got? Hold on. OK, so we also have coming um, over the weekend, this is Burton. Um, he's not here tonight, regrettably. He's got a lot of real world firsthand experience. Um, he's worked as a commercial diver off the BC coast. Um, and again, he's really interested in, in those gear loss um, and impacts of, of fisheries on habitat. He's interested in those problem statements. So he's going to be joining us over the weekend. So make sure if you have questions, you can ask him. Um, we also have Chin, who's coming. Um, Chin isn't a fisheries expert, but he, he works for Spring. He's a serial entrepreneur and program manager. Um, he's got four years, four, more than four years of startup experience. He's really interested in startups um, and I think the kind of things that, that you guys are probably more familiar with. Um, so make sure you say hi to Chin. He's, he's going to be coming tomorrow evening. Um, then we have um, three more remote users from the Triple GI. So Joel. Um, Joel works for Steveston um, Harbor Authority, which is Canada's largest commercial fishing harbor. He's also the founder of the Net Recycling Program at Steveston Harbor, which has sent over 80,000 pounds of end-of-life nylon fishing net to be recycled to date. So again, someone that you want to talk to if you're getting involved in those, those ghost gear statements. Um, Lynn, as well, she's the campaign manager for Oceans and Wildlife at World Animal Protection. Um, she works on the Sea Change Campaign, which is a global program. Um, global campaign with the aim of tracking the problem of ghost fishing gear worldwide through the triple GI. Um, and lastly, Maria, she's the executive director of the Fundy North Fishermen's Association. She's worked there for over 10 years. Uh, she's been involved in small scale fisheries issues since 1991 and has worked with fishermen and women in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Maine, Massachusetts, and Italy. So we have a fairly wide variety of people. I'd say definitely more of an emphasis on the, the ghost gear, which is hammering it out this year. Um, but like I say, we're, we're happy to try our very hardest to answer any of your fisheries related questions. Um, okay, so judging. Um, I'm going to skip through this fairly quickly because it is available. Jonathan sent out a PDF um, and you guys should have hopefully maybe gone through the judging. Um, so like I say, there will be the three of us judging along with um, Another guy who's coming who has background in, in app development. He couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately. Um, but you'll meet him on Sunday. Um, so 
there's going to be three sections for judging. So there's the quality of the idea and innovation. Um, you can sort of see how it scores here. Effectively, we want to see that, that what you're doing is innovative. That's, that's the whole idea behind this. Um, we want to see something new and novel, but you know, something also that's applicable for that, for that statement. Um, impact. So is this something that will actually have a tangible impact on the water? Is this something that can be used on the water? Um, Effectively, yeah, is there a sustainable life cycle and can easily be scaled? And is the interface usable? So this, this is the actual tangible side of, of it working, I suppose. Um, it has to be intuitive and also visually appealing. Um, yeah, and I think last, last year I judged, um, and on, uh, we, we did stick fairly closely to the criteria, but, but at the end of the day we wanted to see something that it didn't have to be flashy, it just had to really address that problem statement. We were looking for creativity within the scope of what that app was meant to do. Um, so keep that in mind. Keep the, the bigger picture in mind in terms of the fisheries. Um, I also know that, um, I'll mention this, there are a few people here. Just wave your hands if you have a fisheries background, please. Yeah. Okay, so there are also a few people here tonight that I didn't mention on the mentors team, because I didn't know they were coming, um, who are well versed in fisheries issues. So um, don't hesitate to ask for questions, for clarification, um, if you're on the right track. And I would say that if you do want to get help um, from any of the, the people who are overseeing the, the problem statements, the contact information is in there, but I would say your best, best advice would be if you come across a problem, Email them right away. Like, just get on that. Make a list of whatever th concerns you might have at the start when you're reading through it, and send out that email because they'll probably be busy over the weekend. And I would say you'll get a response as soon as you can. Um, the Triple GI people that I showed, um, we have their contact information, and they're willing to help you throughout the weekend as well. Um, questions, and Jonathan can help me with this as well if you guys have those. Yeah. Problem statements are on the Fish Hackathon website. No, they're not. Sorry? Dev post. Dev post. We, we'll give you. There is a link online. Sorry, uh, let me introduce, sorry. This is totally off script. Um, we have two lovely guests from, um, from the US Department of State um, who have kindly agreed um, to join us tonight. And so if you have any technical questions about the hackathon, um, they're here for you. Um, yeah, so it's on dev post. We will get you that information right after the tour. Yeah. Yes, anyone else? You guys are just raring to go, aren't you? Excited and raring to go. Cool. OK, go for it. All right. So, uh, so you now know that we have a couple folks here from the, uh, the State Department. We have Erica and Jen here. And they'll be cruising around this weekend and helping to answer questions as well. Uh, also, uh, there's an opportunity for you to um, take the uh, uh, take the work that you do here and uh, start up a business. Uh, .co is a domain uh, company that is offering a free one-year .co subscription for you. Uh, so we'll give you that information as well. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is uh, uh, I'd like you to stay in your seats. We'll wrap up our presentation for now, and we'll talk to you a little bit more about the the aquarium, take you on a tour, and get you. Uh, settled in and ready to hack. All right, thank you very much. And uh, to our online guests, good night. Thank you. All right.